Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Someday with me, Jay Barsky. This episode's guest is motivational speaker and comedian Robert Mack. Robert Mack is a stand up comic that I met taking one of his workshops at the Palm Beach Improv called The Science of Joke Writing. This kind of introduced me to a lot of different elements of comedy and different tools that can be used to help me in my stand-up. But one thing that really inspired me to get into further into comedy is the motivational speaking part, which he discusses in the workshop. As I mentioned, he's also a motivational speaker, so he gives out motivational seminars to a lot of different businesses and corporations outside of comedy, but he still includes comedy into his motivational speaking seminars. So you'll hear us talk a little bit about that. Some things you'll hear us talk about is his Amazon special coming out called Mac to School, along with different practices that he uses to help relieve stress. So thank you for downloading this episode, and I hope you enjoy our Someday with Robert Mack. All right, Robert Mack, thank you for coming to the Someday with Jay Barsky. I'm so you know, happy to have you on the program since we first met. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and thanks for having me. I love, uh, I love chatting on, on these podcasts and getting to share great ideas with people. So thanks for having me, Barsky. Appreciate it. I'm glad to have you on the podcast because how I originally met you was through your workshop that you did at the Palm Beach Improv, which the workshop's called the science of joke writing, which really introduced me to a, like a big different element of comedy and just like what you can do with comedy. I remember just one of your slides just really spoke to me about like motivation. And that's what kind of drew me to doing more of like motivational speaking and how my interest in comedy kind of led me to that path. But I know you do these workshops in other areas. I don't know if you do it online, but just in case if anyone's interested in attending one of these great workshops, do you mind describing a little bit what's it about? No, not at all. Uh, I love talking about comedy. And uh, because of that, I love teaching it. And uh, my joke writing class depends on which one you take. But for the most part, it's a, a three hour seminar on how to make your jokes just a little bit sharper, a little bit stronger. And there's a little bit of science behind it, why people laugh, how people laugh. A big element of jokes is surprise and how the element of surprise works in in the joke writing process. I think a lot of comedians or up and coming comedians don't consider that it's a, a form of writing and every form of writing has an objective. And the objective of comedy, of course, is, is to get laughs. And the workshop will teach you how to streamline the writing to to meet that objective to get get your audience to laugh at your j jokes it's a great class and honestly i'm not much of a great like studious person like i'm not a great note taker and everything but i would say that's the first time i took a class and that i actually like legitly took like notes on everything you had great slides too or i like powerpoint it's all about how you play with it the format you had as, on the professional level was great. I even have, um, you were talking, I don't want to get into too much of it, but there was, you talk about like, I think like 12 or 13 different things that you try to go for for comedy. And I actually have those on my board of just like everything that was mentioned and just kind of reminds me of what I need to look for when I do my joke writing. Tools and techniques of how to, uh, how to make your writing pop a little bit. There is uh, turns of phrase. There is uh, element of surprise. There is using little poetic things. Uh, there's a there's a bunch of them. Take my class and you'll learn more. Whoever's out there listening, it is online often. Um, I also do it at the DC Improv here in Washington DC, and um, you can always uh, go to robertmack.com to find out when the next one is. I know you did it over here in West Palm Beach. So do you do it at other clubs when you do your tours? Sometimes. Uh, I've done it in Arizona. I've done it in the area around D.C. here. I did it in Florida. It really depends on, I did it in uh, uh, California. It depends. Every gig is a little bit different. And if I can uh, teach a class while I'm out there as well, then then why not? You know, there are people who want to learn and I'm getting close to uh, having 30 years in this game. So I think I, I bring a little bit of experience that they have to at least recognize and 
and maybe learn a, a couple of techniques on how to make their jokes better. Wow, 30 years. I didn't know you were in comedy for that long. I'm just over a year now, at least with doing stand up. I mean, I kind of did comedy writing before, but uh, I would say, like, just doing stand up, I'm over a year now. The year, the first year is the most exciting. That's when you really, every time on stage, you can, you can walk away learning a couple of new, uh, new skills or things that you had never seen before. The first, they say the first couple hundred, times you do stand up you're, you're you're learning all these new skills how to get a thick mm -hmm. skin how to relate to the audience how to follow someone who's really quiet or maybe you follow a real dirty act and those require different different strategies i'll say the thick skin kind of like people might say to you to just bother you it's just you have to develop that thick skin or, or they don't laugh at all and you're up on stage for three minutes or five minutes or ten minutes of of nothing but silence. That is when you really have to learn not to take it personally. Yeah. And that, that skin grows, grows thick in those moments. I usually try to think positive. Like if someone's, if I see someone in the audience, like not laughing and I would be doing well, but it's just that one person that's not laughing. I just assume they're laughing inside. So it, it doesn't bother me. That, that is a, a better attitude than I have. I will do a show and 99 people are laughing and one isn't. And that is the one that I'm focused on. <laughs> and it will it will keep me up that night. Like, why didn't they laugh? But I think your approach is probably a little bit healthier. <laughs> but there's always one. There's always there, one who's there just is always arms one crossed. And, <laughs> hmm. Well, I'm, I'm curious because I like exploring different places to perform at. So do you have any favorite clubs that you'd like to perform at? Um, to be honest, uh, the, the DC Improv, where I teach uh, my class when I do it uh, here in my home area, is one of my favorite clubs. But but it turns out that anywhere I can get some stage time, I'm working on some new material now. I have a special coming out, and I'm working on material for the next one. Anywhere where I can get an enthusiastic audience is uh, is helpful. I started in Arizona, so uh, the club in Tucson called Laughs is one of my favorites. And there are some great clubs when I came up in San Francisco called Cobbs and the Punchline. Those are my favorites. Uh, the DC Improv, there's another great club in Denver that uh, is always a good time, and that is the um, Comedy Works. Any, anywhere that'll have me, to be honest with you. When it becomes a profession, and it's not a luxury, then you view things a little bit differently. I don't have the, the luxury of saying, ah, I can't, I don't want to do a set here. I have to pay the bill. So I have to go, you know, wherever, wherever the paycheck is. Mm -hmm. One thing that really inspired me from your workshop was the mention of motivational speaking, which is something you also do as well. And you, you have motivational seminars, which we kind of talked about before. So I'm curious, just how did you get involved with motivational speaking through comedy? I was working at a club and uh, a guy came in who was a motivational speaker and he watched a couple of the comics. And then he pulled me aside and said, I need you to, uh, I'd like to hire you to write some jokes for my, my act, my, my speeches. And I got to know him and talk to him. And they're, they're, they're pretty much the same thing. Motivational speaking is getting on a stage and making people feel better with a message. It's very much like comedy. And he encouraged me to, to give it a try. So I wrote a couple of different talks on using humor to reduce stress. That is a popular one. Um, how to improve customer service by using humor. And it's, um, it's a better paycheck than, than working at a club. But it, it, uh, it uses a little bit similar muscles, but also a couple of, of different muscles. You have to be, you know, the audience is, it's during the day. The audience hasn't been drinking all night. They're not 25-year-olds out to get drunk and have a good time. So there are some differences, but, but at the end of the day, they're, they're very similar. And um, I, I try to, to do them both and, and incorporate as much humor as I can in my talks and people, people seem to like that because a lot of, a lot of motivational speakers are, are on the dry side. So if you can add something, give them more value by having jokes, you're more likely to get hired.
I think that's awesome. And it, it is something that I'm kind of just really exploring just recently, which is why I started this podcast, kind of want to just implement more like motivational speaking and comedy. And it is something I'm interested in to get more involved with. But yeah, I have to like, thank you, because like, that's kind of what led me to just open doors with motivational speaking. Comedy is so popular these days, stand up. And I think it's very easy to transfer that to, you know, different artistic outlets. And motivational speaking is, is one of the easiest to make that transition into. They say that people are more likely um, to do things like at a fundraiser, they're more likely to give money if they're laughing. And they're more likely to listen to your point of view if you're giving a talk. And they're more likely to take your advice if they're laughing during your motivational speech. So adding humor makes people feel better to begin with, but it, it allows you to kind of push your agenda as well. And as comedy becomes more commonplace, I think we'll start to see it in uh, in more places. And I like that because I did see your dry bar special and you talk about but just like more positive thinking. Like So just in case anyone's like interested in like maybe booking you, do you like might want to discuss a little bit like what do you talk about during your seminars mostly uh using humor in the office to make to to increase morale to be more productive to have a a better workplace environment Um, i also can fine tune it a little bit for more specific people i did one uh, talk once for a group that was having issues with customer service so uh, I talked to them. I learned some of the ins and outs of what they were dealing with, and I incorporated that, wrote some jokes about that, included that in my talk, and I was able to to get some laughs and help them improve their their customer service. But for the most part, it's um, I think people who work in an office, uh, those places can get kind of stale, and if you bring me in and let me have some fun with that, I can uh, make it a little bit uh, more exciting. You actually have an Amazon special coming out called Mac to School. So do you want to share a little bit about that special? Yes, I'm very excited about it. I have a couple of specials on, on dry bar comedy, as, as you mentioned, and some producers saw that and they liked it so much. They said, we want to produce your next special. Nice. So we went to my high school in Arizona and we got the theater and uh, filled it and I shot my special there. And we decided to call it Mac to School. It was shot in April. They've been editing it. And we finally got it hooked up with Amazon. It comes out on October 14th on Amazon. I don't know exactly how you would find it, but you can go to my website, which is robertmack.com slash M-T-S, Mac to School. And um, I guess there will be an actual link at some point. But it's for sale and it's for rent. And uh, I'm super excited because this is the first one that was sort of self-produced. And if it goes well, then we can start looking at, at other ones. So what made you want to film it at your high school? Well, um, um, I, I have a, a big following there. The school, I went to a private school and they're very, uh, um, it's a very cohesive a supportive community and also it was uh, much more affordable than trying to rent like a, an independent mm. theater okay. um, and it, it tied in nicely with the topic which is you know Mac to school so let's just do it at my school we got some shots of me walking around and talking to some people I don't know if those will be in the special but the actual performance is um, uh, from the stage uh, where I went and uh, it seemed to it seemed like a good idea to incorporate my past into, you know, my, my newest special. No, I'm always interested in kind of like the environment of where standup is taking place. It's just kind of my interest in when I do explore like different places to perform at. It's always interested, like how the people set it up, how the, the sound is, the environment, whether it's a bar, maybe it's like a hidden area, low key, or maybe outside. I think it's awesome that, you know, you have it filmed there. And like, I'm just curious of like sound too, because like I work with the audio. So I'm just like a kind of a geek for like how audio equipment is set up at. 
That that's a great question. It's a theater, and, and theaters are my favorite place to perform because they're designed the way they're laid out. It's designed to give everyone a great view, and、mm-hmm. the acoustics are good. Oh yeah. These these guys set up a bunch of mics and they mic the audience as well, so we got some of the feedback. And it's funny that you mention that. I had a meeting earlier today, an an online meeting, of a group that. Uh, they're talking about hiring me for a company event, and they showed me pictures of last year's event,、mm-hmm. and it was a big ballroom with a bunch of round tables, and everyone's sitting at tables, which is the worst way to do comedy because、mm-hmm. half of the people are faced the wrong way. Yeah, and when you're in a big ballroom, the lighting isn't a spotlight on one performer; it's this weird dark corner where they put the stage,、mm-hmm. and and those are tougher. Because it's not an ideal situation. A theater or a comedy club; those people know what they're doing, and the look and sound is is a hundred times better because those venues are made for those types of performances. So I'm I'm looking now at doing、uh, smaller tours through comedy clubs and small theaters because it's it draws a different audience and it's 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 just a better a better feel than performing to. Backs of people who are eating at a at a buffet at a corporate event.、Mm-hmm. I kind of want to go back. You mentioned that you've been in comedy for thirty years now. So, what brought you to starting that journey? Almost thirty years. It's coming up.、Uh, it's twenty nine and whatever three quarters. I've always loved、uh, always loved comedy, and I had some friends who did it, and they went to open mics all the time, and they. I, I wrote some jokes for a friend, and he did my jokes on stage and got a lot of laughs. And I felt like he was, I felt like he was stealing my thunder. And so he pushed me and encouraged me. And it, it took some time; it took a couple of months, but I finally tried it on stage and fell in love with it. The first set was very, very successful. They put me up after the audience was warmed up. They they mentioned it's this guy's first time. Be nice to、okay. him, and it went well. And I got, you know, there's an acting bug, and there's a stand up bug. And I got bit by the stand up bug, and I just I fell in love with it that first time, and haven't looked back. Yeah, my first time doing it, like, and my buddy was pushing me to do it. And he was telling me like, let them know it's your first time, and people will be happy and cheer for you. And so when I went to finally do it for the first time at this bar, like I was the last one up, and they just you know were giving me some some time at the full set, and like I even mentioned like it's my first time. I didn't hear any cheering. I think everyone was just tired and stuff. And I was like, oh, this is what what I thought was going to happen. But I just did my set just to knock finally just knock it out. Like no one really clapped, but. I get it. It was the end of the night, but I mean, I've been doing well ever since. But it wasn't what I expected to be for my first time. Context is everything, and if you go up in front of a tired crowd that's already seen a lot of comedians, yeah, <laughs> you're not going to get the same response as if you go up. Like I went up, I think fifth, and there's probably 15 people or 20 people. Yeah. So they were they were not drunk yet. They were still paying attention. Yeah. Context is a is. Is crucial in everything, but particularly stand up.、Mm-hmm. I hope I hope the second time was was strong enough for you to to continue to do it. Yeah, yeah. Just to say, it was just like I remember the first time. Like I I didn't really expect much, anyways, from it. But like it's just like I always was told, like people will cheer for you if you say it was your first time, and no one cared. I discuss a lot about like motivational speaking, and just I'm curious about my guests on how like. What inspires them, influences them to continue on with what they're doing in their career. So, one of the first things I'm curious to ask you is if you get stressed, and what do you really do to relieve that stress? I get stressed. I've been stressed recently because I I have the special coming out, and it, the we're we're taking too much time and and getting the promotions out. But what I like to do、uh, when I'm stressed is、uh, I like to go on a run. If I can't run. I like to go on walks. I like to get out. I like to do a little bit of exercise, and both walking and running kind of clear my head. Running is a little bit better because I get the heart rate and you get those endorphins from that.、Um, I've had some issues, health issues recently, where I haven't been able to run. But even a good walk, I'm not far from a creek, and there's a path along the creek, 
and I see all sorts of uh, deer and foxes and, and, and ducks and all sorts of nature, uh, that helps reduce my stress. I've tried meditating. I don't do it frequently enough, but whenever I do, it seems it seems help to help me not get rid of my thoughts, but just kind of accept them and kind of push yeah. them aside. Those are my, my, my go-tos, walking, running, meditating. Do you have any favorite parks that you like walking at? Because I'm you live in D.C. and I've been there a couple of times and there's always great places and routes to walk around there. There, there are. And to be honest, I'm just outside D.C. and there's a place called Sligo Creek. And there is a, a, a creek that goes for miles and miles and it's not very far from my house. So I'm able to, to, to get out in nature by, it takes me five minutes to walk to the creek from where I live. So Sligo Creek in Maryland is, is my go-to. You mentioned like being comedy for 30 years and you do tour around. And one thing I've been really careful on when I do my stand-up now, or especially times when I'm doing a lot of my stand-up, it's just my diet of how I'm eating and just watching what I'm eating. So do you have a specific diet that you like to share? Uh, not specifically. I try to eat well. Um, I try to have more salads these days. I notice that if I, if I stay out late and I do a lot of later night shows, then I eat too late. And when I eat too late, it's mm. generally stuff that's not that good and yeah. it messes up my sleep. And then, so then I get heartburn. So uh, I try to not eat after uh, after a show if it's a late show, and that's not always successful. But that's that's the plan, at least. It's tempting. I mean, just being out, you know, at night, and if you're at a like kind of barish restaurant, especially with a place with good food and stuff. Right, right. It's it's yeah. hard to say no. Yeah. And I'm not much of a drinker anyways, but I like to support local businesses. So like I'm tempted to buy food anyways. I try to I try to get to here's my secret is I get to my shows early. And um there are a lot of comics who show up at the last minute and it drives the bookers crazy because they're having a heart attack because they don't know if the comedians are going to be there. Mm -hmm. So Anyone who, who wants to get into comedy, go early. You'll make the bookers very happy and you'll have enough time to eat and not worry uh, uh, about eating after the show. I've done so many shows where the comics say, oh, I'm going to eat after. And after the show, the, the kitchen is closed. And go early, eat before the show, and that way everybody wins. Yeah, that works. I like it. And maybe just a little specifically, do you have like routine practices that you like to like practice to whether it's with, you know, your personal life or with comedy, whether it's like writing or specific times you wake up, do you have like certain practices that you do? Over the years, I've, I've tried a regular writing routines and I haven't really stumbled on any until this year, until like my 29th year, I finally, the way the schedule works where I live. I'm able to do writing in the morning. And because I don't have to be anywhere in the morning, I have some time to be alone with my thoughts. And I generally prepare the night before and I write down like, oh, these are the jokes I want to write tomorrow. So um, I do a little hour long writing session every morning. And I also, if I'm not performing at night, I use my evenings to uh, rehearse my material. So if I'm not doing a show, I have copies of, I call them my scripts. I write out my jokes and print them and I use those scripts to, to learn and memorize them and I rehearse at night. So rehearse at night and write during the day on the days that I'm, I'm not traveling or something. And I find it to be a, a game changer. And I know uh, a lot of people, uh, who have a nine to five job might not be able to, to write during the day, but I think any habits that you can maintain over time are important. And having a regular writing period is, was very helpful to me. Oh, that's helpful. Cause I want to say this month, I'm trying to really like dedicate myself in doing, writing some new material. I'm trying to work on like a new five, 10 minute set. So I'm trying to like, been, I've been gathering a lot of my thoughts lately it just because I've just, just been doing a lot of stand-up and doing and another five-minute set. So no, that's helpful that 
I really need to like push myself and like devoting myself like that much time to pen to paper and everything. And I, I would emphasize that we do have to push ourselves because there's no boss. There's nobody who, who will check in on you and say, hey, did you rehearse your material? And that is one of the hardest parts of stand-up is you have to be your own boss and force yourself to do things. And I, when I teach my classes, I try to emphasize to the, the students who are mostly newer comedians that a five-minute set only takes five minutes to perform, but you can rehearse that 10 times during the day in between, on breaks, in between meals, while you're at work, while you're walking to your car, as you're driving home. And the more that you're able to rehearse that, the, the stronger your performance will be. And the, the only way to get better in, in comedy is performing. And the more you rehearse, the better those performances are. But again, there's nobody making you do it, so you have to force yourself to do it. So that's some of the advice I give is whenever you can, rehearse your next set. I would say being your own boss is the, the best thing about being self-employed, but it's also the most challenging. It's the like, worst. <laughs> it's the worst. Who, who, nobody has to is making me get up and make the bed and, and start my day and do my writing. Um, but it's taken me, like I said, it took me 29 years to finally find the right routine that works for me. Oh, that's great. Cause I have spurts where I'm like just inspired. I'm just on it. And then, I, then I have my times where I'm just laid back and I just go with the flow and I'll do it tomorrow and tomorrow becomes next week and next month. Yes. But having said that, when I'm in, in my lowest energy state, I can still at least um, maybe not sit at a computer and write, but I, I can at least jot down notes or um, read stuff that I've written before. And then that re rehearsing, you can do that laying in bed or laying on the couch. So there's no excuse to, to do nothing. There's always something that you could be working on if, if you want to make it in this business. And it's a, it's a tough business to make, it, to make it in, I'll tell you that. So are you working on anything? You mentioned the special, but are you working on anything that our listeners should watch out for or should be streaming? Um, I will be starting uh, once, once we get our, our, our social media campaign up and running to promote the special. I will, in theory, have more content that I will be pushing out. So um, keep your eyes peeled for that. But the exciting part for me is that once all this, the, the special is out, that material I really don't need to do again. And so I kind of push that aside and work on newer material on stage. So for people who, who want to see where I'm performing, you can go to my site and um, I'm generally, um, I do a lot of open mics and uh, we'll be working on, on newer stuff. And as a performer, the most exciting part of comedy is when you do new stuff for the first couple of times yeah. and it works. There's nothing yeah. more exciting than, and thrilling than that. Right. And so that's what I'm working on right now. Those are the best because you're like, I don't know how, I know it, it's going to, or I think it's going to be funny, but you're like, I don't know how the world will react to this. And when it goes well, there's nothing more exciting than oh, that. Yeah. yeah, my favorite's always the one that gets me laughing and then it gets the audience like crazy laughing. Like that's, that's the best ones. If you can genuinely laugh on stage and it's not a, a fake or a put on, yeah. the audience will, will follow because there's nothing more honest than that, than a, a true laugh. Yeah. We're wrapping up here. So any final words you want to leave our listeners to help motivate them in pursuing their dreams and pursuing their someday? I would say that if you want to get into comedy or, or whatever you want to do, just go at it. Start now and just, just do it. The only way to get better at anything, especially a performance art, is to get on stage and just do it over and over and over. And eventually you will hit new le levels and new plateaus and you will continue to improve. That's, that's what I've done. And I keep hitting new uh, heights in my, in my career. Like I said, I've been doing this 29 years. I recently had an uptick just uh, a few months ago where I feel like I hit a whole new, I found a whole new gear and I'm working at a completely different level. So stick at it, I guess is, uh, is my, my advice. Whatever, whatever your dream is, 
stick to it. That's the best advice I've heard is like, just do it. Like whatever it is that you want to do, like your thought that you've been thinking about doing, just do it. Don't even think about it any longer. It sounds, it sounds like a cliche because Nike has turned it into one, but there's, there's so much wisdom in that little saying. There's so many comics I know who sit around and complain and, and, and don't get out there and do it. And the reason they're not successful is because they're, they refuse to do it. They'd rather complain than make it happen. Yeah. So don't hang out with them. Find, find positive people to, to follow and hang out with a crew that, that, um, that shares your, your goals and dreams too. That's another good one. Yeah. yeah. Awesome advice. Well, Robert Mack, this has been a pleasure and like speaking with you. And I'm so happy that you got a chance to sit down and talk like this. Definitely we'll do it again, but appreciate this from the bottom of my heart. But thank you so much. Barsky, you're welcome. And whenever you want to do another one, I can talk forever about comedy. I can talk forever about writing jokes. I can talk about a lot of different things because uh, I'm, there's some things I'm really passionate about. And whenever you want to have me back, just let me know. Thank you for listening to our episode with Robert Mack. Make sure to catch his Amazon special Mac to School and stream all his albums that are out right now. Follow him on all his socials, which you may find in the episode notes. I hope you enjoyed our episode with Robert Mack. Please rate and comment on this podcast to help make it grow. If you want to follow me on all my socials, it is I am Jay Barsky on everything. Thank you for listening to our episode and I'll see you soon.